Hey, my name is Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. And at our church, we talk a lot about wanting to be a part of restoring faith in Jesus and the church. So we want you to know, wherever you find yourself on your spiritual journey, whether you're deconstructing or reconstructing, whether you're disentangling, doubting, rebuilding, no matter where you are, we want you to know that you are not alone. And we want to be a support for you as you journey down this road of faith. So if you have questions or you need support, we would love to chat with you. You can reach out to us through our website at restoreaustin.org. And we hope you enjoy this week's message. It's so much fun to be in here all together. Um, it's a little bit of chaos, but in the best way. Um, if you missed Sonia's announcement at the beginning, uh, this is one of our family Sundays. We do about three or four of these a year where all of Restore family members, big and small, are all together. Um, and I just want you to know, like, if you're a parent who has kids in here and uh, they're a little bit rowdy, um, that is okay. Like, that is totally fine. It's just part of being a, a kid and part of being a parent. And um, don't feel like, oh, I got to make sure everything is exactly right and all of that stuff. Like, you can't do that. That's impossible. If you're a parent, you know that. Um, but the other thing is, if you are an adult in here who doesn't have kids, maybe uh, you don't ever want kids, or maybe it's just not the right season for you, or whatever that looks like, and sometimes it can feel like, oh, this is like a lot, and I don't really like come to church to like be around a bunch of children. I just want to challenge that for a second and say that regardless of if you're a parent or not, um, you have this responsibility from Jesus to love and care for um, those among us, especially the most vulnerable. And some of the most vulnerable among us are kids. Um, and the way that you are uh, demonstrating love for them as a direct reflection of the way you demonstrate love for Jesus. Um, Jesus said that in one of his parables when he said, let the little kids come to me and you have to have faith like these little kids. And so I just want to challenge you today to understand that. Remember that as we are all together as one big family. But to get started this morning, I have a question for all the kids. What holiday happens tomorrow? Halloween. Nice job. Good hand raising back there. Great work. Halloween. Yay, hey, Addy. I'm super excited too. Um, and what do you do on Halloween? Yeah, all that. Yep, candy, costumes. Um, what's this? Spider-Man mask. Yeah, it's a little bit small for my big head, so I can't actually strap it on. I just have to hold it up. Thank you, Addy. I appreciate that. Um, but listen, while wearing a mask on Halloween is awesome... Wearing a mask the other 364 days a year is kind of strange, right? I'm not talking about like Halloween masks or COVID masks. I'm not even talking about any kind of real physical masks. I'm talking about the way that sometimes we put on a mask and try to pretend like we're someone that we're not. We try to do that for a myriad of reasons. No matter our age, we're tempted to wear masks like this all the time. Like when we want to prove ourselves worthy to someone else. Or we're afraid that, you know, maybe someone won't like us if we don't wear a mask. Or when we want others to feel sorry for us or impressed by us or just love us more. In fact, we even do this with God, right? We put on masks with God because we think God is mad at us or disappointed with us or even unable to fully love us if we don't have this certain kind of Christian mask on. And we often think that wearing masks like these makes us more lovable to God and to other people, but actually, that's not true. In his wonderful book called The Cure, John Lynch writes this, no one told me that when I wear a mask, only my mask receives love. We can gain admiration and respect behind a mask, we can even intimidate, but as long as we're behind a mask, any mask, we will not be able to receive love. And then in our desperation to be loved, we'll rush to fashion more masks, hoping the next one will give us what we're longing for, to be known, accepted, trusted, and loved. First time I read that first sentence, it like slapped me in the face. When we wear a mask, only our masks receive love. When we pretend to be someone else, only the person we're pretending to be receives love. And listen, I get it. I'm tempted to wear masks too, because just like everyone else, I've experienced moments when I've tried to be like my full vulnerable self come into a room that way and only to be rejected, only to be made fun of maybe, cast aside. And that rejection, right, it like stays with you. And if you've experienced it enough times, it often feels easier to just put on a mask and go about your day because you don't want to have to risk the pain happening again. 
But living your whole life behind a mask means living your whole life unable to truly receive love. Because again, when we wear a mask, only our mask receives love. So how do we break free from the false belief that life is meant to be lived behind a mask? That it's safer, easier, better to put it on when we get up in the morning and not take it off till we go to bed at night. Well, I think it all starts with understanding who we are, or more specifically, who God says we are, because that is our truest identity. Right now, we're in the middle of this teaching series about this very topic called identity. And over six weeks, we're unpacking these often overused and underexplained terms used to describe Christians in Scripture. We've already covered identity statements like beloved, unified with Christ, and holy. Today, we're talking about how each and every human is treasured by God. Treasured by God. Now, I have to make very clear from the start, we are not treasured by God because of what we do or how we behave. We are treasured by God simply because we exist. We are not more or less treasured because of our accomplishments or abilities or even our beliefs. And we are certainly not more treasured by God because we're wearing a super cool Christian mask. God sees right through those anyway. God treasures us. Listen, God treasures you exactly as you are right now. Each of us stands before God both fully known and fully loved. God does not treasure some idealized version of us that might come someday in the future. God completely loves us and thoroughly treasures us as we are right in this very moment. We are treasured by God. It's who we are. It is a part of our core identity. Now, you might be thinking, how do I know that's true, Zach? You don't know me. You don't know what I've done or who I am or how many masks I've worn throughout my life. And listen, that's true. I don't know all that stuff. But I still know and believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are treasured by God. I know because I've experienced it firsthand, but I also know because it is all over Scripture. I mean all over God's great story. This morning, we're going to look, as Sonia said, at one of those stories where Jesus makes it abundantly clear that we are seen, known, pursued, and treasured by God. It's found in Luke 15. And uh, you can turn there in your Bibles. Verses also be on the screen. As Jesus traveled around during his life, the ancient Near East, crowds would gather around him and he would enter into times of public teaching. These times are actually recorded all over the gospel accounts. Stories like the one we're about to look at that are often called parables, these stories Jesus told, were usually told during these times of big teaching. But that's actually not true for the story that we're about to look at today. You see, Jesus isn't in the middle of teaching when he tells this story. He's in the middle of eating when he tells this story. And that's really important. I'll explain why in a second. In fact, in this story, Jesus isn't even the first one to speak. The story is told by Jesus in response to the accusation of someone else. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came and listened to Jesus teach. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and even eats with them. See, sharing a meal with someone society deemed unworthy is a pretty big deal today, even in our context, right? But in the first century Jewish culture, it was actually much, much bigger. I want you to listen to how Malcolm Smith describes this scene in his wonderful book called This Son of Mine. This quote is long, so bear with me, but it's really good. In our Western culture, our first thought in eating is to satisfy hunger. There may be other reasons we eat, but essentially we eat together because it is mealtime and we are hungry. In the countries of the Middle East, eating was and still is a relational event. One ate bread to declare, establish, nurture, and seal a covenant relationship. To eat with someone was called table fellowship, and it meant that the persons eating at the table now stood in covenant solidarity with each other. So for Jesus to eat with tax collectors was not a social blunder done in ignorance. It was not a political gaffe of a newcomer to religious politics. He ate with them intentionally as a deliberate public act, sending a clear message that he knew could not be misunderstood by anyone. He was announcing, listen, that he was the friend of tax collectors and sinners. He was standing in solidarity with them, declaring a covenant of friendship. He sat there by choice 
and so accepted the shame, rejection, and hatred directed toward them as his own. Sitting with them plainly said that he would go to any length and pay any cost to embrace them where they were. Now we can better understand, right, why some of the religious leaders were scoffing at Jesus as they watched him eat with these notorious sinners. They couldn't believe that he would enter deliberately into covenant friendship with those that they considered unworthy or unclean. But I love this. Instead of like arguing with them about purity laws or lecturing them about God's radically inclusive family, Jesus decides to tell them a story. Here's the story. Verse three. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the open country and go searching for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. Now I realize many of us hear a story like that and we have a very negative kind of connotation to the word lost. But I think that actually has more to do with what lost means today and how it's often been kind of weaponized rather than anything Jesus is actually trying to communicate in this story. So let me explain. In our broader society, right, lost is kind of used to mean a few different things. It could mean gone, right? Like I lost my grandfather. I lost that money on a bad business deal. It could mean off track. Like we should have been there 15 minutes ago. You're lost. I've heard that before once or twice. It could mean obsolete, right? Like this is a lost cause. It could mean missing. Like I lost my phone. I lost this, I lost that. Obviously, most of those have a very negative connotation, but it gets even worse when you add in how lost is usually used in Christian contexts, right? Because Christians often use lost as a pejorative label for someone who's not a Christian. Now, you might be thinking, lost is a pejorative? Okay, go ask a random person on the street if they're a Christian. If they say no, tell them that they're lost. (laughs) See how it goes. You'll understand if it's pejorative or not, okay? It's, it is. I just, spoiler alert, it's not going to go well. Don't call me when you do it and it doesn't go well. This whole mindset, this posture is deeply connected to the kind of terrible Christian purity tests we talked about last Sunday. Christians are good and clean and in. Non-Christians are bad and unclean and out. And this is the exact same uh, attitude that the religious leaders had in our story. They couldn't believe Jesus was eating with people in covenant solidarity with people who were lost. But that's not at all what Jesus means when he uses the word lost. You see, for lost, for Jesus, lost means something of transcendent value. Lost means something of transcendent value. It means something worth turning your life upside down for even doing something crazy or seemingly confusing like leaving the 99 to go find the one. You see, the lost sheep story is actually the first of three stories that Jesus tells to illustrate this point of just how treasured we are. The second one is called the lost coin. It goes like this. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. See, this lost coin is so precious to the woman that she turns her house inside out looking for it. She won't stop until she finds it. That's the second story. The third story is probably one that you've heard of. It's called the lost son, or sometimes it's called the prodigal son. It's about a kid who disowns his whole family, takes his father's money, leaves home, vows to never come back. But even after being treated so poorly, And even though it went against every cultural norm in this honor and shame society, the dad, who was rejected by the son, spends part of every day standing on top of a hill, waiting, watching, hoping for his son to come home. And then one day, the son does just that. Here's the father's reaction. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. See, who cares about societal expectation? Who cares about what it cost? My lost son is found, the dad said. Let's throw a party. This is what Jesus means when he says lost. 
It is something of transcendent value worth turning your life upside down to find. When Jesus says lost, he means treasured. When Jesus says lost, he means treasured. This is how God sees you. Whatever your age, whatever your race, whatever your gender, whatever your socioeconomic status, whatever your sexual orientation, whatever your disability, your background, your lifestyle, you are treasured by God. You realize, of course, though, right, that being treasured by God and, and being of infinite value to God and, and worth turning his whole life upside down to come pursue us, that this is exactly what God did. These parables aren't just stories that make a point. They are stories that point to the greatest story ever told. Just like the shepherd noticed his sheep was missing, just like the woman noticed her coin wasn't where she'd left it, just like the father noticed his son was lost, God saw us. God sees us. God saw us struggling to make our way through this broken world and God turned everything upside down to come and be with us. God put on flesh and made a home with us in the person of Jesus. And as we've seen in this story, Jesus spent his life seeking out and lifting up people who were lost, people who were pushed to the margins of society, people who were oppressed. Jesus made it clear over and over and over again that God's family has room for absolutely everyone who wants to be a part of it, that there is a chair at God's table for absolutely anyone who wants one. And then Jesus conquers sin and death and the evil behind them through his death and resurrection. Jesus overcame hate with love, overcame death with life, and now he lavishes his love and life upon everyone. Why? Why leave the perfection of heaven and come to the brokenness of earth? Why put on flesh, go through life, end up being killed in the most gruesome way possible on a cross. Why do all of that? Because God treasures you. Because God loves you. Because God will stop at nothing to show you how true that is. We are infinitely valuable to our creator. We are fully known and fully loved and God is fully committed to doing whatever it takes to remind us of that. So now the only question remaining is, how do we live like the treasures that we are? How do we kind of make a life in this love of Jesus? Well, I think it starts with taking off our masks. It starts with not pretending we're someone that we're not, to try to be more liked, more loved, more accepted, and realize that you are liked and loved and accepted by God and hopefully by any healthy church community that you've ever been a part of. You can put aside your need to impress, your toxic shame, and your fear that when you're fully known, you won't be fully loved. Now, this doesn't mean you don't have problems to overcome or struggles to face. It doesn't mean you aren't sinned against or that you don't sin against others, but it does mean realizing that none of those things define who you are. And you get to pursue healing and wholeness from the love and acceptance that God provides, not for the love and acceptance you hope God will provide someday. Like we've said throughout this series and and throughout this year, God is love and you are God's beloved. You are treasured by God, so much so that God leaves the 99 to go looking for you when you've wandered, that God turns the house inside out to find you when you're lost. That God stands on the hill waiting, watching, and hoping for you to come home no matter how far you have strayed away. You are so treasured by God that God turned everything upside down to put on flesh and make a home with us in Jesus. This is your identity. This is who you are. And my friends, no matter what you've told, been told, no matter what you've heard, even in churches, it is who you have always been. It is not just who you are in this moment. It is who you have always been. You are treasured by God. Worth turning everything upside down for. To help us remember that, I'm going to end this morning by reading one of my favorite books for us real quick. It's a kid's book, but if you're an adult, I defy you not to be moved by it. (laughs) Defy you. 
Um, it's going to be on the screen behind me so you can follow along. Kids, have you ever seen this book before? It's called When God Made You. It's one of our favorites at our house. You ever seen this one? Okay. I'm going to read it. You can also look at the pictures on the screen behind me, but I want you to follow along because I think it's really beautiful. When God Made You by Matthew Paul Turner, illustrated by David Cattro. You, you, when God made you, God made you all shiny and new. An incredible you, a you all your own, a you unlike anyone else ever known. An exclusive design, one God refined, you are a perfectly crafted one of a kind. Because when God made you, somehow God knew that the world needed someone exactly like you. You, you, God thinks about you. God was thinking of you long before your debut. From the very beginning, amid history and time, you, little one, never left God's mind. God imagined your eyes, your head's shape and size, and he knew what you'd look like when you felt surprised. God pictured your nose and all 10 of your toes, the sound of your voice, God had it composed. The lines on your hands, your hair, every strand, God knew every detail like it was all planned. Out of billions of faces from cultures, all races, people God made from all different places, God knew your name. I defy you not to be moved by it. Your picture is framed. God's family without you would not be the same. Because when God made you, this much is true. The world got to meet someone God already knew. You, you, when God sees you, God delights in what is and sees only what's true. That you, yes, you, in all of your glory, bring color and rhythm and rhyme to God's story. So be you, fully you, a show-stopping review. Live your life in full color, every tint, every hue. Discover, explore, have faith, but love more. And learn and relearn all that God made you for. Use your talents and passions, those gifts that God fashioned. Think up ideas and then put them to action. Because God loves you creating, your true self displaying. When light on the inside through art is portraying. When you make believe, the stories conceived, the heroics, the magic, those tricks up your sleeve. When you dance alone, spinning like a cyclone, being whoever, whatever, in a world all your own. God smiles, and here's why. In the spark of your eye, a familiar reflection shines bright from inside. Because when God made you and the world ood and odd, in heaven they called you an image of God. You, you, when God dreams about you, God dreams about all that in you will be true. That you, God's you, will be hopeful and kind. A giver who lives with all heart, soul, and mind. A dreamer who dreams in big and small themes, one who keeps dreaming in journeys upstream. A mover, a shaker, a lover of nature, a builder of bridges, you, the peacemaker. A you who views others as sisters and brothers and lives by three words, love one another. A confident you, brave and strong too, you being you is God's dream coming true. Because when God made you, all of heaven was beaming. And over you, God was smiling and already dreaming. This is how I want you to think of you when you think of you. This is how I want you to live and be and move in the world. Because this is the truest thing about you. All that other stuff, all the stuff that people put on us, all the masks people try to make us wear, all the things that they say, None of it is as true as what God says about you. That you are treasured and loved and worth turning everything upside down for to be with. Okay, I'm gonna pray. And then, the moment we've really all been waiting for, the furry friend will come in. Okay, God, thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for this beautiful time together. And I thank you for uh, our furry friend that I can even hear now behind the curtain. Just pray that we would remember who we are and who you are, how much you love us. And we would love others in that same way. In Jesus' name, amen.